The Nintendo Game Boy recently entered its third decade since its 1989 release. I have to be honest, I didn't think much of it when it came out, but history tells a story of massive success. With sales of 118 million units, boy was I wrong when I said nobody would want to play this thing as I wrestled with its hard to see screen. So to apologise for my dismissiveness, let's give this Game Boy a birthday makeover and some upgrades to see if we can't finally become friends. RMC is supported by MonsterJoysticks.com. Level up your retro gaming with their joysticks featuring genuine Sanwar arcade parts. And OneClickPrint.com for your photos on canvas, acrylic, gifts and more. Local craftsmen and global delivery. Hello cave dwellers, welcome to the cave. Yes, it's the turn of the Nintendo Game Boy. Why? Well, because it turned 30 years old recently, and I remember playing this thing back in 1989 when it first came out, and being distinctly unimpressed. I'm sure I'm not the only one. I know history tells a different story. This is a hugely successful device that sold over 118 million devices. When I got it in my hands in 1989, hmm, I thought the screen was terrible, I couldn't follow any fast moving action, and if you tried to play it in direct sunlight, which you probably would as it was a portable device and you'd be out and about, I just couldn't see what was happening, so I didn't rush out to buy one. And um, of course Nintendo improved on that with subsequent versions, introducing things like a backlight and it became a better and better series of devices. And this here is our donated DMG01, the original Game Boy, and it looks pretty battered. And so it should, I'd be disappointed if it didn't to be honest. This is a device that's clearly been used and um, hopefully loved, but now it does need some TLC. You can see if we look at the screen here, that uh, screen cover has obviously been reaffixed at some point. It looks like they've used super glue and then proceeded to smear it all over the screen. So that's something we're going to have to sort out as well as cosmetics in general. But electronically it's fine, there's no sign of the capacitors failing. My slightly illegitimate 32-in-1 cartridge works just fine and I can play all the classics like Tetris without a problem, other than the original problem of not being able to see the screen. So my objective today is to give this thing a birthday makeover. We're going to cosmetically fix it and we're going to see if we can find a way to improve the screen so that I might actually enjoy it a lot more than I did first time around. Maybe I can find some love for the uh, original Game Boy. Now, when it comes to these situations, I always like to turn to the experts, someone who has a bit more experience than me working on these specific devices. And who better than Elliot at the Retro Future, a man who lives and breathes Game Boys all day long. So Elliot, for a stage one fix up, uh, refurbishment and upgrade of an original Game Boy, what would you recommend? Hello Retro Man Cave viewers, Neil has messaged me and asked me to give him a couple of tips on modding a DMG Game Boy. Um, so yeah, the first thing you're going to want to do before you do anything else is make sure your shell is clean, make sure the buttons are clean, clean the board with isopropyl alcohol to get good button contacts, um, and then you can start to tackle some of the common mods on DMG Game Boys. So obviously you're going to want to fit a, a backlit screen. The, uh, the screen which comes included on the Game Boy is just rubbish. Um, a backlight really just makes everything pop and really makes everything stand out and obviously you can see in the dark. If you're going to install a backlight, why not install a Biber to get better contrast? It's a pretty easy chip to install and definitely worth doing. Yeah, that's pretty much about it. Um, yeah, have fun. <laughs> so let's tear down our Game Boy. Let's fix it up and this will be a single episode Trash to Treasure from start to finish. We're going to avoid the history of the device because I think it's been comprehensively covered in other videos. So this is just about refurbing and hopefully it will help you guys out there too to give your own Game Boys a birthday makeover. Let's tear it down, let's get started. To tackle this yourself then you don't need too many tools but you will need a tri-wing screwdriver tip to open the outer casing easily. The screwdriver set I'm using can be found in the video description should you want to treat yourself to some new tools. We want to be careful on opening the case because there is a ribbon cable connecting the front and the rear PCBs so just be mindful of that and gently hook the cable out of the connector, hopefully avoiding any damage as you open it. 
And there is our Game Boy, which doesn't look too dirty at all on the inside, but let's continue to deconstruct it and we'll see what we find. Once inside, all of the screws are now regular Phillips screws, so we'll work around the board to remove those and free the PCBs from the shell itself. If you're unlucky when you open the shell, you may hear the crunch of broken plastic. The screw posts in the corners where the tri-wing screws hold the case together can be very brittle after 30 years. You can see mine are intact, but there are definite cracks present. If yours is like mine, you may want to touch that up with some super glue just to reinforce it. Our board then lifts out, and aside from a lot of dust and debris on the screen, it's not looking too bad at all. The display is a reflective STN or Super Twisted Pneumatic LCD, comprising of a not so whopping 160 by 144 pixels. We'll also remove all of the buttons for cleaning, as suggested by Elliot. Now he did suggest cleaning the boards up, but we're going to do that last. The reason being, the screen upgrade is very delicate indeed, and if I break the screen then it's game over. I'll just have a clean PCB to show for it, and that would be something of an anticlimax. As we lift out the rear half of the Game Boy, the CPU will be revealed, which is a Sharp LR35902, which is similar to an Intel 8080, with a sprinkling of the Z80 CPU's instruction set to enhance it. This is complemented with 8KB of system RAM and 8KB of video RAM. Understandably, for its compact form, it's a machine with limited capabilities, but there was a wealth of coders with experience on the 8-bit home micros which came before it, and they were at the top of their game in 1989. They would, and did squeeze the most out of the Game Boy. Let's remove the final parts so that we can wash the plastics later, the most fiddly of which are the battery plates here which you can poke out with a thin flathead screwdriver. There are early signs of corrosion on mine so we'll want to clean that up or replace them later on. Now the Game Boy screen is something we want to treat with extreme care. The cables are prone to ripping and tearing, and it's not something you'd want to try to replace, and cracking or smashing the screen is really easily done. Our screen has cleaned up nicely, but here we encounter the first problem, columns of dead pixels on both the left and right sides of the screen. To repair this, we first need to remove the rubber strip along the base of the screen, and while we do this, our soldering iron is warming up to around 350 degrees C. We'll put a dab of solder on the tip just to help transfer heat, and then we're going to slide the iron along the edge of the cable and the screen. This will reflow the solder under the cable. We're not directly soldering anything here, we're just trying to reflow the existing solder, and that in turn will re-establish the connections. With the device still turned on, you can see the effect it's having as we run the iron along the cable there. And we have success, all the pixels are now working again and we can progress to our first upgrade. And that's a backlight which looks like this. Quite simply, it's a bunch of LEDs which sit behind the screen to light it up, and on ours two wires are pre-soldered to tap into a power source. To get this fitted, we'll remove two screws from the ribbon cable here to give us some more movement as we need to work behind the screen. Pop the screen out using the gap at the top of the frame using something blunt and create some space to work behind it. And now comes the tricky bit. We want our Game Boy screen to be completely transparent, removing all layers from the back of the glass. This includes a clear layer which removes quite easily. I'm using a disposable scalpel here to get it started, and then I can peel it away from the screen. As that layer comes away, you'll see some of the next layer coming with it, and that's a silver layer, which I hoped would come away with it, and I tried my best to peel off in one go, but it just wasn't playing ball. Now there's a valuable lesson to be learned here, because I'm making a mistake. Some of you may have spotted it already if you're familiar with the Game Boy. I didn't realise at this point that there is yet another layer under the silver foil on the screen, and you can see just what a pain removing the silver layer is on its own. I delicately removed it while trying not to apply pressure to any one part of the screen, which would cause it to crack, and I was successful in doing so. But 
once I've cleaned it up, you can see that our screen isn't completely clear. It has a green hue to it. That's because there's another layer. The lesson here is to be braver than me, get your scalpel or craft knife behind all of the layers and you may find that they all peel off a little more easily than my painful demonstration here. And while filming, I haven't yet realized that that green layer is there, so we will come back to that shortly and we'll continue with it in place. The backlight itself is nice and easy to fit. It simply slides under the screen with the cables hanging out of the base there. I performed a quick test without it soldered in to make sure I hadn't killed the screen at this point and all was still well, and so on with the backlight. It comes with its own polarizing layer to fit on the screen, which is also a key component to the Bivert mod, which will fit later as you'll see. Power from the backlight is drawn from the points where a capacitor is soldered in just below the screen here, which I'm soldering to now, and my kit also includes a resistor which helps to regulate the voltage to the backlight. Now your personal preference might be first to feed the cables to the other side of the board and solder on that side. I chose to solder here and feed excess cable through the hole. I'm sure you can do a neater job if you want to, but just ensure you don't obstruct the areas where the D-pad or the buttons will be. Another power on test now with our 32 in one cartridge, which of course is officially licensed by Disney with that Mickey Mouse logo on. It must be, surely. Our backlight is working, albeit with a green tinge, and that's when I realized we still had that extra layer on the screen and took a moment to peel it off. I really don't enjoy this. If you feel like you're on eggshells every step of the way and that screen could crack at any moment, and indeed, there are plenty of examples on YouTube where it does. I've been very fortunate here not to smash mine. The knife and some hot air made fairly short work of this layer, and while it needs a clean again, you can see it's no longer green. So, good, an embarrassing mistake has been inverted. I don't think anyone noticed, right? On to our next upgrade then, and that's the Bivert mod, which takes place on the rear PCB. Here's the connector where the ribbon cable from the front PCB connects, and you can see I've lifted legs six and seven on the connector. I just wicked away the solder with some solder wick and slid a scalpel under to lift those legs. This is so we can fit a small PCB which I purchased from the company Deadpan Robot. Again, links are in the description. It's a very simple device and here it is. Really conveniently, the chip is mounted on a small PCB with holes above the solder points you need to use and two pads to bridge over to the legs on the connector, which I'll now do while trying not to get my head in the camera shot unsuccessfully. The chip is a hex inverter chip which, quite simply, takes an input, inverts it and spits that out as an output. The effect this has is that instead of only displaying the pixels to be turned on on the screen, it turns on all of the pixels except for those which are to be displayed. It inverts the image. The polarizing layer we fitted to the backlight can then be turned and put back in to invert the display once again, so what we see is a normal image, but the result we're promised is greatly improved contrast. That's the idea behind it and we'll see if that, combined with the backlight, gives us that kind of result very shortly. Just as soon as I've cleaned up the screen of the last of the glue residue, cleaned off the pads on the PCB with some cotton buds and isopropyl alcohol to make sure our buttons get good contact, and once we've briefly turned our attention to the shell itself and put it all back together. The final stage today then is to clean that shell down, and here is the shell. Thankfully the superglued screen cover popped out quite easily and we can replace that with a new one. An option would also be to replace the entire shell as there are many many cheap spares out there and replacement parts for the Game Boy like this shell. But I think that would be cheating and I want Alan's Game Boy to remain as original as possible, albeit with those upgrades. What the replacement shell does show us though is that our original shell has yellowed slightly, just a tiny amount, enough for me to notice despite the artificial lighting in here but we will try to fix that. If you're considering a replica shell, there are some minor differences that a collector would spot. The font is ever so slightly less bold, and the text is not quite in the same position. Compare the position of the start and select text, for example, it's not quite right. You can see it's just slightly out. But that being said, it is a very, very close replica. I haven't handled enough Game Boys to say if that text varies on the originals, but I would have expected Nintendo's quality control to have been pretty tight. So into the tub it all goes, the shell, the D-pad, the buttons, and the rubber pads all into some warm soapy water for a good scrub.
As it was the weekend, I decided to take the shower home for some retro brighting. Being the UK, sunshine is scarce and summer isn't yet fully upon us, but there was a window of opportunity this weekend for a bit of brighting. I was out of liquid peroxide, so I used some Bee Blonde 40 volume cream peroxide in a container with some warm water and gave it a good stir before covering it and leaving it out in the sun for a few hours, during which time I hung out with my cat Gizmo. Gizmo is a fat cat. The result then is that our restored shell in the middle here has shed its yellow tinge, just enough for me to be happy with it, in fact I think it looks better than the replica. And now we can put it back together, we can affix a new screen cover, and I sanded down the battery terminals which had a little corrosion on but they were only surface deep, so they easily sanded off. And with that I can put it all back together and I can show you the result of our Game Boy's birthday refurb. So what do you think then? Let me know your comments below. Do you like what I did with it? Do you think I went too far? Are you a purist that thinks these things should be kept absolutely original? My opinion on that is I don't do this so that I can put these things on a shelf or so that I can sell them. I do this so that I can actually use them and for me it was essential that we upgraded the screen. Just like when we upgraded the screen on the Atari Lynx. If you saw that episode we installed a McWill screen which immediately made it a much more usable and playable device. And the backlight and the Bivert kit here does exactly the same for the Game Boy, albeit at a much lower price. So I think purist or not, I do recommend those upgrades just as Elliot from the Retro Future recommended them to us. Thank you, Elliot, for your advice on what to do here. Now, there's always more that you can do. In fact, I've got right here a capacitor kit to recap the Game Boy. There's about 19 through hole caps. So not too big a deal, certainly not a laser active size job to uh, recap it, so I'll, I'll be doing that next. And also um, an upgrade that's often recommended is the Pro Sound upgrade, which improves the audio. I'm not too fussed about that, I don't mind the original um, sound of the Game Boy, but I will look into it, and if it looks interesting maybe we'll make an episode on it. But for now, my main priority is simply to play it and to enjoy it. Thank you again, Alan, for the donation of the Game Boy. I hope you've enjoyed seeing it being fixed up and it will certainly be looked after here in the cave. As always, thank you for watching. Take care and see you next time. If you enjoy my content and would like to toss a coin into the hat to support the cave, then check out patreon.com forward slash retro man cave and join the official cave dwellers you can see on the screen now. Thank you for your support.